our next set of guest speakers, we have a, a tag team presentation by Chris Hale and Missy Partika. Uh, Chris is with Heart Research Institute for Gulf of Mexico Studies and Missy is with Mississippi Alabama Sea Grant Consortium. Um, they're going to be sharing about what communities need to prepare for disaster uh, based on uh, work that was done between our team in partnership with uh, Gomery and also the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine's uh, GRP program. Um, Chris's fun fact, in her own words, I have an identical twin sister. We switched seats in class only once in high school, German class, but we did not succeed in fooling our teacher. This was because I was the one who knew how to speak German, but my sister did not and we should have picked another class to uh, switch it up in. I still got an A, but I still can't recall much German other than Ich bin Chris. <laughs> um, as for Missy, Dr. Partika's fun fact is that today is her birthday. And she's also a champion saxophonist. Is that right? Did I get it right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, Chris and Missy, take it away. All right, thanks, Em. Um, and thank you, Vanessa, for setting us up so nicely to um, get into the, the human dimension side of things today. Um, I just want to thank everyone for hanging in there. I know it's, it's a long webinar, but we've got a lot of great information to share. Um, as Emily said, my partner in crime, Missy, and I will be sharing with you today about a project um, we worked on together along with the rest of the CD Grant Oil Spill Science Outreach team. And we think the results of this project not only helps shine a light on the specific needs of communities in the beautiful state of Louisiana, but also in other communities across the United States, but the, the results also help underscore the interdependence of healthy ecosystems and healthy people and healthy communities, which is our theme today. Um, and I also want to take a minute, of course, to give a shout out to the National Academy's Gulf Research Program that funded this project along with the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative and various Sea Grant programs. Um, but I especially wanted to thank the hundreds of participants that participated. They shared their time and their thoughts with us throughout um, this, this project. So thank you to them. Let's see if I can go on to my slide here. So I have to click. There we go. All right. Um, all right, so starting in the spring of 2018, um, the members of the Sea Grant team pulled together a steering committee to design and carry out a workshop series. And as you can see in the center of the screen here, the overarching theme was regional priority setting for health, uh, social and economic disruption for spills. And so um, we were designing a workshop series that looked at, at this theme. Um, and we were doing this in several regions across the states. And these workshops brought together to the communities in order to identify those priorities um, for improving preparedness for oral spills, but really specifically within the context of human health. Um, and I'm going to be sharing about the, the Western Gulf Regional Workshop that's circled there in yellow. Um, and Missy is then going to take over a little bit later and share with you some details about those other regional workshops. All of the results from those workshops are available for download that you can see there on the bottom of the screen, the, the Gulf Sea Grants website. I also just want to take a moment to let you know that the locations uh, for these workshops were discussed at length with our um, steering committees and workshop planning committees and our Sea Grant partners in each of those regions. Those regions were selected because these are areas where oil spills have happened historically, whether they're large, huge spills or smaller continual spills. And these are regions where more spills are likely to happen now into the future. Um, and then the actual workshop location, um, they were selected because we felt that this, those towns, those locations um, were a little bit easier for some of our other um, folks from far away could get to. And also we were looking for both a regional and a local perspective. So we wanted other folks to come into these locations, share what they had to share from their respective communities, but also um, shine a light on some of those very localized experiences as well. 
So what was it that we actually wanted to get out of these workshops? Well, in general, at the end of the day, we wanted to deliver a set of recommended priorities to the National Academy's Gulf Research Program, as well as other funding institutions that were looking to support communities in a meaningful and impactful way. Um, but that's a pretty broad target. So with our steering committee's help, we narrowed it down to these outcomes. So we wanted our participants in each of the workshops to suggest protocols to include in existing response and regulatory frameworks. So there's already response plans um, that are in place. There's already regulations in place. We weren't asking folks to reinvent the wheel or to change law. We want their ideas about the protocols that do exist um, based on their own experience. We also wanted their project ideas, knowing that there's a lot of funding coming down the road for um, oil spill preparedness and disaster preparedness in general. Um, we want to know what these communities felt were good ideas as far as projects and what to spend that money on. We also wanted them to identify research and outreach priorities, um, identify resources available and perhaps resources that weren't available. And ultimately, too, um, these workshops were a great opportunity to foster new connections and partnerships. Um, you know, there's different audiences that we serve, as Emily highlighted um, earlier on in the, in the webinar, and those audiences don't often get to, to come together and interact and learn from each other. So these workshops were a chance to do that. So diving in on the Western Gulf workshop, as I said, um, we held this um, December 4th and 5th in 2018 in Houma, Louisiana. Um, the title there was Prioritizing Health and Oil Spill Preparedness, and it was facilitated um, by myself and the rest of uh, Texas U Grant and my other team members. Um, and HOMA, as many of our listeners probably already know, are already familiar with, but for those that might not be, HOMA is home to a mix of oil industry workers, tribal communities, fishing families, and other residents who have very strong ties to the natural resources um, in the coastal area of Louisiana. And over time, they have continued to experience multiple disasters um, in addition to oil spills like floods and land loss and climate change. So we felt um, holding this workshop here in Houma um, was, was a, a, a good way to represent what's really going on here in the, in the Western Gulf. So each workshop was designed, um, as I said, with a steering committee, but each separate one had its own planning group. And that planning group had to come up with themes. So we weren't just talking very generally about what are the priorities. Again, we were talking about very specific things that were important to the communities in the Western Gulf. So the planning team pulled um, past workshop reports, um, needs assessments that have been done over the years, and consulted experts to narrow down these themes. And so effectively integrating human health, well-being, and social dynamics into response planning was a big theme. Building economic resilience to future events and creating a transparent compensation process creating a network for effective risk communication, and developing disaster recovery programs based on audience needs. So those are the four theme areas. Each of those themes then set us up for uh, breakout group discussions. And so the format of these workshops was we invited experts to address those theme areas. So we had, um, emergency responders from NOAA or US Coast Guard and other experts just like like Vanessa and she and Melissa Finnegan, they addressed some of the, the research in human health and dimensions and disaster resilience and risk communication, etc. So we had a bunch of presentations and um, listening time and then we broke out into smaller groups and we discussed um, these four questions that you see on the left side of the screen. Again, um, those are that that was our way of funneling the conversation towards those outcomes that we were trying to get. And so you can see in the picture there, Missy is, is scribbling all of her, her notes from all of the great feedback that she's collecting from that particular group. So I'm going to share just a sampling of the results from those breakout um, discussion sessions. We have a lot of great feedback to share, um, but not enough time today to go through all of them. Um, just keep in mind that 
these tables that you see are summary tables and only just a few summary tables at that. So if you want to see more detailed responses from our workshop participants, please do go to that workshop report, um, especially in the appendix. That's where the, the raw data is, is kept. And so we were tasked um, after the workshop to kind of filter out the, the main categories of what people were talking about. And that's what these tables are, really. You have number of responses. So you can see here for the protocols discussion as it pertains to human health, um, community well-being and social dynamics and how it's integrated into response planning, communications is a very hot topic. Um, and in fact, communications across the board is a hot topic for, for improvements. Um, and then you've got response, information access, education, training, and planning, and research baselines and monitoring. So again, those are just the key sort of ideas or categories that we pulled from the conversations. But to give you a taste of some of the ideas here in this sort of conversation bubble, I pulled out some examples. So when a call is received, and they're talking about um, hotlines that are set up during an oil spill response, when a call is received, the responder asks lots of questions to assess the situation in order to understand the magnitude of response that will be needed. Maybe responders can change the line of questions to have a human health slant to inform the response. For example, they could ask the caller, how are you being impacted, versus only asking the caller, how many gallons of oil are spilled. You know, so that might seem like a, a very simple sort of idea, just change up the questions. But um, in the response world, there are very thorough and comprehensive response plans um, that are made way ahead of any incident. And once they're approved by all the appropriate agencies, um, there's then training that has to happen and spill drills and scenario planning. Planning, there's a lot that goes on to what happens during a response. Um, and so this is, the, uh, an example of how a protocol could possibly be, be changed based on um, this, this one workshop participant's perspective. So another example here for um, ideas for pilot projects, specifically for building economic resilience. We see here the, the key categories up here. They, they started getting really into research and outreach ideas, but they also mentioned some employment diversification ideas, um, improving partnerships, and getting access to information. Of course, there were some other um, ideas as well. But an example here is that can food banks, shelters, churches, and other groups work closer together on a regular basis so they can be better prepared when crisis occurs? create a co-op of shared funds or resources and involve food banks. Consider the people who live day to day or paycheck to paycheck. So again, looking at that economic resilience and thinking about the different types of groups that are being impacted. And there you can see our fabulous host, Emily, jotting down some answers on the that split pad right there. Um, here we're looking at research and outreach ideas. And so this table split into research and outreach. Um, and this was specifically for developing audience-based spill recovery programs. Again, communications comes out on top, but also you can see um, more research is needed um, at different time points throughout recovery. Um, and an example here of an audience-based recovery program uh, is youth. So someone mentioned youth. Youth are particularly vulnerable but underserved. Young community members are vulnerable to misinformation or false information while also being overlooked during a response. People that deal with youth issues should be tapped to interact with response communication to ensure young people are not left out of the conversation and not overlooked for potential mental health threats. And I'm sure some of this might um, bring to mind, maybe you have your own children um, who spend a lot of time on social media and perhaps are absorbing some sort of misinformation and likely negative information. So this is an idea here that someone brought up looking at that type of audience as far as recovery goes. So finally, um, some tables looking at the resources. Um, there were a lot of really wonderful suggestions for um, the, this Louisiana workshop where um, actual names of organizations, names of tools, names of individuals, names of you know, health clinics, et cetera, 
were, were listed. And all of those ideas are available um, in the report. Um, but I also want to draw your attention to what is needed. Again, um, if you haven't picked up yet, communications um, needs to be improved. Communication, I guess, approaches or tools um, as a resource. Funding and training um, come out on top. And one example here that I pulled out as far as training goes, I pulled out because it looks at the fishing community, which of course, as we know, is very important to the Gulf Coast. Um, it has implications for our economies and our culture. Create workshops for fishers to help them adapt to changing conditions. Connect them with information on changing conditions and how to change with them, such as entrepreneurial training. So I know that was a lot of really quick information about some of those results and very broad um, tables, but in general or in summary, um, I just want to let you know the sort of key points here. Um, we know that um, from the HOMA workshop in, in Louisiana and across the, the West, Western Gulf, um, there is a need for short and long-term communication. Again, um, those phases of response, you know, the responders go in and do an excellent job cleaning up the spill, but it doesn't stop there. Recovery and restoration takes a long time. Um, that communication needs to continue over the long term. Also, education and training is needed, especially um, about economic resilience. Um, you heard a little bit earlier from Vanessa about um, the compensation process. Um, that is definitely one that caused a lot of people's stress and anxiety and impacted the health of a lot of communities. Um, so some more tools and training as far as um, compensation, but also the claims and just in general, um, what other options do folks have as far as uh, livelihoods go. And the need for connectivity with communities to improve information flow was also a key theme here. Um, the, the theme of trust came up um, a lot, and so there was a lot of suggestions about creating um, relationships, especially looking for those gatekeepers in certain communities, those liaisons, you know, folks that want to help the response community, the, the recovery and the restoration communities, they want to get access to those communities and maintain those relationships so that information can continue to flow. Um, and that goes both ways. Those communities will also want access to the response recovery workers themselves. So we need to find a way to make that happen. So again, this is where you can go to access the report specifically to the Western Gulf that took place in Houma, Louisiana. You can download it from that website. But at this point, I'm going to uh, hand the microphone over to our birthday girl, Missy, and she's going to share uh, more about the other regions. Thanks, Chris. And it is my birthday, but I feel like birthdays shouldn't count during COVID, so I get another year back as far as I'm concerned. So I'm going to spend the remainder of this time going over some of the other outcomes from the other regional workshops. We heard a lot about what just happened in Louisiana, as we should during a Louisiana-centered webinar, but I think it's also worthwhile seeing some of the commonalities that we have with some of the communities across the Gulf of Mexico and maybe some of the differences. Seeing some of those differences helps us kind of further highlight why there was a need for these regionally specific approaches to begin with, but I think you're going to see a lot of things in common. So to begin with, uh, the very first workshop after the HOMA workshop in 2018 was up in beautiful, very cold Anchorage, Alaska, and Chris and I both had an opportunity to go up there and assist Alaska Sea Grant with holding that workshop. Um, as we all know, community members down here continue to hurt 10 years after Deepwater Horizon. It may surprise you to know, or perhaps not, the community members up in Alaska are continuing to hurt 30 years after the Exxon Valdez spill. What was apparent during this particular workshop, and I'm just going to go quick highlights from each of these workshops, was that there continues to be concern over past impacts to subsistence resources and fisheries as well as potential future imp impacts to these resources. And a lot of times when uh, people hear about subsistence resources, they are thinking about fish and fisheries products, but it's not just that. It can be medicinal and ceremonial resources and things that maybe if we did not include members of Native American communities, responders 
and researchers would not necessarily know that these were high priority items that needed additional attention or communication about the value of those resources. One thing that became incredibly apparent is that in order to get that information, we have to involve community members. We have to involve different nations and we have to involve members of different villages. Unfortunately, Alaska is also a very huge space. And that means a number of these communities are incredibly remote. For example, as an anecdote, we had some community members that were involved in the Alaska workshop that were stranded for a number of days because a storm had come in and the limited about uh, that they have to be able to travel back and forth is by small plane and they could not leave to go home. So just think about trying to organize a meeting or get folks in the room to talk to the response community or try to get research conducted when you're so remote that just a, a storm can ground you for a, a couple of days from being able to go back home again. And these are ideas that come out during these workshops. But it was also clear that there were a lot of issues facing a number of these community members that weren't just oil spills. Yes, oil spills you know, were on the horizon. This is what we were there to talk about. But through global climate change or changes in land allocation or you know, mineral rights or drilling or um, reduction in the available uh, ice sheets, so those opening up shipping channels and really changing their access to native fishing and hunting areas. These are all weighing on these communities. And I think that's something we can appreciate in Louisiana and in uh, coastal communities in the Gulf as well, that there's a lot of things on our minds and it's not just oil spills and that needs to be considered. Down in Santa Barbara, hosted by the University of Southern California, Steve Grant, uh, they took a slightly different approach. There was a recent oil spill in 2015, and so they took it from a case study standpoint for the refugia oil spill. And they brought together community members, state and federal entities, nonprofit organizations to talk about lessons learned following that response. It became apparent that there was a need to build these relationships in. So in the event of an additional spill, a future spill, they wouldn't be starting from this ground up where there was this miscommunication between community members, the resources that were out there, potential volunteer efforts. Again, it became apparent that there needed to be greater inclusion of Native communities in early discussion and planning, not just in the midst of a spill when communications are most difficult. But really it was clear that there is a concerned and passionate community out there that are eager to volunteer and wanna be a part of these response efforts and that's a resource that's available that needs to get tapped into, but that can only be tapped into if those lines of communication are established early on. As Chris referred to, the majority of these regions where these workshops were being held had experienced oil spills in the near or far term, but there was some kind of collective knowledge and understanding about what those spills meant to the community. However, the one hosted by Virginia Sea Grant out in Virginia Beach, there was not that collective knowledge. They had not had a major spill. They did not know what to expect or how their community would respond or what the resources were that were in place, much less lessons learned. So the bulk of this workshop really got to the basis of creating these connections and fostering community relationships with researchers, with responders, with resource managers, with policymakers to open these lines of communication in a way that I think it was advantageous to them, and I think all of us were a little envious of, prior to a disaster, establishing these relationships. But it was also clear that there was a need to tailor communication to individual communities, that it could not be one size fits all. And as Chris referred to, having those liaisons, those gatekeepers of communities to help foster in these flows of communication. And that it couldn't just end here, that it needed to be continued workshops and outreach activities, that this couldn't be a one-off where it was opening a door only to allow it to close again with time. Now, the final workshop in this five-part series was hosted in Alabama, and I had the opportunity to lead those. And I also got the great advantage of getting to learn from some of the other workshops that took place, understood where there was additional needs that needed to be filled, how we needed to tweak our approaches. And these are things that we promised we would try to do throughout is understand how do we get the most amount of information in order to move the ball forward with this entire project. So to begin with, I hosted a fairly standard type workshop in Mobile in, in May of 2019. 
just like you see here and you've seen on the pictures of the other ones in a conference room in a hotel setting with flip charts behind us and folks sharing their information and breakouts and speakers with slides uh, presenting information. And we got a lot of great information. Some of it was similar to what we heard in HOMA and some of the other regions, and some of it was different. For instance, they talked about the need for public information officers, those trusted individuals that are specific to communities that might actually be in the inner circle of response communication, that they can go out to the communities and more rapidly feed information out to them, rather than being this lag and they're trying to figure out who's telling us the most accurate information, how do we make decisions, they've got a trusted individual in place. But something that was interesting is they also talked about the need or the lack thereof currently of safe spaces for community resource or, or staff. As many of you might have experienced, either through the most recent storms or in times past, a lot of these really vulnerable communities are in low-lying areas. When storms come in, there are forced evacuations. And not only are there forced evacuations of individuals, but they're forced ev evacuations of resources. They might not have the ability to house ambulances or fire trucks or things like that um, in the actual communities, much less staff for uh, city offices, et cetera. And so those things have to evacuate. And it might be something as simple as having secure spaces to house resources closer to these outlying communities so that they have the opportunity to react more rapidly in the you know, event of a disaster. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, it seems like a simple suggestion, but that can make a, the difference to a community and their ability to respond and be resilient to a disaster. But something else that also came up, as came up in HOMA, was to talk about young people. And while they talked about really making sure that they're uh, changing their engagement strategy or the way that they're communicating uh, with youth in the HOMA workshop, they talked about tapping into early childhood development and education in the mobile workshop. And I think as Chris was saying, you know, kids come home, especially younger kids, they've learned something new at school, they're sitting around the table and they want to tell their parents, they want to tell their auntie and uncle, they want to tell their grandma and grandpa, they want to tell their older siblings about what they learned that day. And if we had the opportunity to tap into those early educational experiences and talk to them about disaster preparedness, and what it means to be resilient and what are other opportunities are out there to start these conversations early on and start them around the dinner table. There might be some benefit towards resilience down the road. Well, as I said, we listened. We heard that we needed to shift things a little bit. Something that became apparent through some of the other workshops is there were sectors of the communities that we were missing out on. And those were members of communities that couldn't afford to just take off during the day and go to a conference at a hotel and sit around and fill out flip charts and do breakout sessions. We were missing some of those community members that were likely to be the most impacted and the most often overlooked or unheard uh, during these events. And so uh, we decided to host an evening event down in Bayou La Battery at a community center some place that was familiar to community members, some place that they felt safe engaging and meeting their neighbors. We brought in a ton of food. We allowed them to bring their children, artfully covered up with little emojis right here. Um, we didn't put any confines or constrictions on where the communication or flow of or information would go. We allowed them to vent grievances. We allowed them to ask questions. And where possible, we extracted what we thought their needs were. And some of the highlights that we saw from that was an immediate and apparent need for multilingual outreach and training approaches. Um, we had four different languages were being spoken in this one community center room, and we had a couple different translators, none of them formal translators. And so it became pretty obvious, communicating what our questions were, trying to understand what their needs were, and opening up dialogue with the response individuals that were in the room was challenging. But it was worthwhile seeing like, this is, this is a gap and this is something that needs to get filled in. But they also had a lot of concern about restoration and protection of natural resources. As we heard from the talks earlier today, these communities are integrally involved in the natural resources and they need a healthy gulf in order to sustain their communities, their culture, their lifestyles, their families. And they are concerned about long-term impacts after an oil spill as well as other disasters. 
So that's something that's important of understanding our ties to the landscape and what that means for community resilience but also the need for regular early engagement, long-term engagement with these communities, not just showing up in the midst of a disaster and then, as they say, parachuting back in only to just leave again right after the disaster is resolved. That's difficult uh, for communities to deal with in the most extreme situations. And then prevention is key moving forward, MICU. I'm gonna briefly go through some of the research highlights um, that we follow, as, as Chris said, there's a lot of information out there, all of it's compiled in these reports, but I want to hit a few key of these. In gray here are the Western Gulf outcomes from, from HOMA, and in yellow are the Eastern Gulf outcomes. So looking at outreach and research needs, we saw five key priorities. The first and foremost was incorporating um, human health and, and well-being. That was the, the largest response, followed by involving local communities, improving communication, which is not surprising, improving and expanding education and training, and then finally building sustaining trust. That's something we've talked about multiple times during this. So briefly, each one of these is gonna be one of those little pie wedges. Highlighted in yellow is what came out of the, the Western Gulf, and you can kind of see where the HOMA workshop fell in with the rest of them. But incorporating human well-being ideas that coming out, figuring out ways to integrate human well-being into the response. Seems pretty straightforward. Chris talked about one of them, like just changing up questionnaires, but also characterizing pre-spill well-being, something that I think a lot of us have heard about, that there's a need for baseline understanding so that we can understand what are impacts to communities and what does that mean for community recovery. Communicating, communicating, communicating. Chris talked about it. It's a major priority for all of the regions. The Western Gulf fell right kind of in the middle right there, but really, figuring out ways to characterize best communication practices for these diverse communities. And that's diversity of age structures, diversity of socioeconomic structures, diversity of languages. There's a lot of different ways to engage with communities and we need to figure out the best ways to do that. Involving local communities is a great way to figure out how to communicate with them. If you start talking to them early and often, they're gonna tell you what they need. And that's something that became apparent during these workshops whether it's focused groups or dedicated engagement, um, they're gonna tell us what they need if you listen. Improving and increasing education and training, obviously. Chris talked about diversification of the workforce, but really creating additional work uh, educational programs to increase awareness of not just the res national response plan, but also local and regional response plans. And then creating training programs for responders so that they understand locally relevant information and who the people are that they need to talk to and what are those resources that need to be protected. And then finally, a big one, building and sustaining trust and figuring out ways that we can continue to foster trust with these communities between our, our researchers, our responders, policymakers, et cetera. So universal needs that we saw across all of the workshops were communication, community engagement, transparency, and training. And based on this word cloud here, a lot of people care a lot about prevention. We've got the question and answer session next, but I can say that in conclusion, we think it's evidence from all of this that uh, environmental disasters from a decade ago are still impacting communities today. And we know that Louisiana folks are, are resilient to and familiar with multiple disasters, but that doesn't mean, mean that things don't need to change. We can't improve our communication in the way that we engage with communities and the way that we translate science back to them again. We hope that these workshops and the re reports that again, you can find on our website, um, really make this apparent and clear and are a starting point to help move this ball forward again. So we thank you to all the participants in the workshops. We thank you guys for joining us today. And I think now we'll take any questions. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm gonna ask all of, thank you very much, uh, Chris and Missy also for, for sharing that important work that you all uh, led on behalf of our team.